My next guest, just back from the region. She was four years as Middle Eastern correspondent for CBC News, but now, of course, our chief correspondent. And immediately after the war began, she was there with the National and hosting that uh, newscast and program from, from Israel. So our chief correspondent, Adrian Arsenal, thanks for coming in. Back safe and sound and happy to see you. Hey, nice to see you. Uh, also, I like what you've done with the place. We, we, uh, it took a three and a half years post-COVID, <laughs> but we're finally back in our old studio. Great to have you as the very first person in this part of, of, of our, I won't of our new home. I'll okay. try not to wreck it. <laughs> Perfect. Listen, um, impressions, reflections. Now that you're back, mm -hmm. as someone who spent so much time there, what is different? What are you thinking about right now? The what is different question is, is really important. And I, I, there's so much that makes this, this, the unprecedented word has been overused to describe this. You, you hear it everywhere. But I think if we break down why that is, it's about scale, it's about speed, it's about surprise. So the, the scale of it is, is obvious. I mean, I don't, we haven't seen numbers of, of horrific deaths and injuries like this ever there. So, you know, you, you've heard the descriptions. I think Joe Biden said it would be like 15 9-11s for, for uh, the Israelis. Uh, that, that is true, you know, you're talking about population-wise. The, the numbers of, of Palestinians who are dying uh, is, is terrifying. So if you look at, um, let's say, between 2008 and a few weeks ago, uh, a, a terrible number of 6,100 Palestinians had died. We are horribly catching up to that number already, already. In, mm. in just a few weeks. So the scale of this is shocking. Uh, and the speed at which it's happening is shocking. But the surprise element is still something that people haven't gotten over. Certainly Israelis haven't gotten over it. How on earth did they miss this? We've heard apologies from Shin Bet, apologies from the IDF. No apologies from Netanyahu. That one needs to come soon, according to Israelis. But this was such a surprise that they didn't see this coming, that now there is questioning, how much do they really know about Hezbollah? Hmm. How much do they really know about Syria? How much do they really know about what Iran is up to? It's such a surprise that there was, that there's an Israeli a television series called Fauda, which uh, Fauda is Arabic for chaos. And it's, it's, a, it's a controversial, very dramatic series about the fight of Israeli intelligence and forces against Hamas. The script writers approached the producers some time ago with a plot line about Hamas invading Israel, taking the fence and, and staging a series of invasions in the kibbutzes. And the producers said, no. You know what? That too is outlandish. Too, uh, too outrageous. It would never happen. Israeli intelligence would be all over it. It, it would be done it, immediately. I reject that plot. And now here we are. And 17 days after that initial attack, we got new numbers this morning from Israeli officials. 222 is the number now of hostages. That's going up, not is, down. Yeah. I'm wondering how the hostage situation, in your view, might change next steps or outcome in all of this. So it's impossible to look into the future. Uh, it, I, you know, if, if I learned anything there, it's that everything you think might happen is the opposite of what likely will happen. But there are considerations you have to keep in mind. I was there when a lone soldier, Gilad Shalit, uh, was taken in, in, 20, uh, in 2006. He was held for five years. Mm -hmm. There was an exchange of 1,027 Palestinian prisoners uh, five years later for Gilad Shalit. And of those prisoners, Hamas maintained that, that some of those prisoners collectively were responsible for the deaths of 580 Israelis. So you're talking uh, about prisoners who who had committed acts of violence. A thousand prisoners for one soldier. If you got 200 plus people who are held, what do you do? What, mm -hmm. what do you do? You know that this is the reason, they are the reason, one of the reasons why you haven't seen more Israeli troops on the ground in Gaza. They don't know where they are, they don't know who's holding them, and they don't know how they are. So the, the Palestinian Red Cross immediately was in contact with both Hamas and Qatar, which is a, a, a country that has long been involved in hostage negotiations, saying we need proof of life, we need to see them, we need to get medicine to the most vulnerable. They're still struggling to do that. So the pressure from the families to say, hang on a second with this uh, ground force, where are our family members, it is enormous. And I have to say, a lot of the survivors who I spoke to said, please don't kill more children to 
uh, avenge the death of our children. Please mm -hmm. don't do that. Uh, until one woman said, un until the Palestinians have better lives, we're not going to have better lives. So there is enormous pressure. Well, while Israelis want something to be done, there is enormous pressure to sort of take slower steps and get more aid in there immediately. That's coming from the Biden administration. Yeah. This pressure is well more reportedly hold off on that ground offensive until progress can be made on the hostage negotiation with the help of Qatar, as you mm -hmm. say. But I'm wondering, as we look at what's happening militarily right now, huge bombardments overnight, massive numbers of airstrikes, and we're watching the northern border, so yeah. Beirut, uh, Beirut, Rebecca Collard reporting on Beirut. We're watching on West Bank as well, back and forth skirmishes there, clashes as as well involving Syria. What are the scenarios that we should be watching for next? Well, th there are a number of, of people um, within the is Israeli cabinet who are very hawkish, and th they are pushing for a preemptive strike against Hezbollah, a signal to Iran, don't, don't do this, don't get involved, we're going to hit you hard. That is not an overly popular uh, position to be taking r right now uh, from the perspective of the Americans and, and some is Israelis, because Hezbollah of 2006, which is when Israel was last at war with Hezbollah, is not the Hezbollah of 2023, right? They have 150,000 missiles aimed at Israel. They are more precise, they are bigger, they are stronger, and they are more trained. This is bad news for Israel, right, if that happens. Lebanon is in a rough spot. You know, it additionally has 1.5 million Syrian refugees. You know, it has horrible problems with its economy, with poverty. Pe people need a better life. They don't, they don't need a war landing on their heads right now. So there is, watch what happens with the North. Watch to see whose voices, whose voices resonate. Come to the fore. Mm -hmm. And also watch what happens with, with the ground forces. There have been Israeli raids in to try to get hostages and they haven't they haven't worked so far that's a, that's a signal that they don't really have a sense of what's going on in gaza but the americans are saying don't follow our lead after 9 11. don't don't do what the united states don't give did. in to that anger you talked about right don't Be let rage drive you because what on earth was the plan for afghanistan what on earth was the plan for iraq what a disaster what a disaster and and to go into Gaza at this point, I think it terrifies anyone who has ever set foot in that sand. It is so cramped. There are so many kids. The median age in Gaza is 18. These are, these are children. No wonder you're seeing babies being carried frantically. They're, they're children. They had nothing to do and with what's going on. And you're one of the very few journalists who spend any degree of time in Gaza. Yeah, I, you know, I have very strong memories of Gaza. Um, I have very strong memories of Rafa. I was talking with a little guy. He was maybe four. I, I have like this much Arabic, just enough to say hello to children and, and have a little chat. And above our heads was an unmanned aerial vehicle. So I'm not talking a little drone, I'm talking a, a big surveillance drone. Mm -hmm. And the sound of that drone, this little guy, his face dropped and he immediately peed his pants. He was so terrified by the sound of, of that drone. And, and I think about him all the time because he'd be in his 20s now. Where is he? Is he alive? Is he okay? How did he ever deal with the trauma of the fear? Because he knew what that meant. He knew that that, that's, that was a precursor to terrible things happening. I've heard the strikes there. It's horrible. I've seen, I've seen what happens to civilians there. It's horrible. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I, I think anyone who has been there or watches it is, is horrified for what might happen uh, for everyone if troops go in en masse. I don't know. I don't know how this ends. Come back. We'll talk about it again, if you will. Thank you. Our chief correspondent, Adrian Arsenal. Thanks, and we'll look forward to The National as you continue with your team still on the ground yes. to bring us the very latest. Thanks, Adrian. You bet.